I've heard it said before, Afropop, Afrofuturism even, it seems that recently there is, I might even go as far as call it an obsession of Africans to attach their identity to the works that they do. And I'm wondering why, why is African identity so important? Who better to answer this question for me than some young Africans? And one of them actually named his album, very audacious title, Live and Die in Africa. So we're gonna start with you, Bien. The African story is our story told by us as told by us because for the longest hold on so if if dw is a source let's put ourselves let's put ourselves on the line here yeah. dw is providing the platform dw is certainly not african no but this is the african story told by us we are the ones who are telling you what we are about okay so the african story is the story of africans as told by the people of africa tetu tetu shani another musician has asked no no no, no. tetu shani has asked another question no. who is us who that, is africa that's, that's my question is who is us because the africans who where no <laughs> no wait 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 how, ma how, how many generations does it take to be defined as african is what i want to know uh, okay does anyone have an answer to that question how many generations does it take for you to be defined as african assuming that your background or w what we call your indigenous roots are not african any answer any takers yeah. It doesn't have to take generations. I think we have people who have lived in Kenya maybe for 10 years right now, and they see themselves as Africans. It's actually how you carry the African pride, how you see yourself, how you respect the culture, how you respect the heritage, and what makes you feel you're African. Is it? It doesn't have to be skin color. You know? <laughs> well, I'm actually very surprised that we have not brought up the issue of skin color yet. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yes. I, I don't yes. think. <laughs> I don't think now. it's it's. Uh, it's, I just want to build on what she said. I don't think it's enough for you to see yourself as an African. The African people, the community that you're in, has to see you as an African. You get, it has to be a two-way thing. This, I can't is, this is a very philosophical oh, wow. So to be just, is to be perceived. Yes, to be African to be is to, to be, be perceived. perceived. I can't just insert myself into Africa and feel African. Oh my God, I feel African. No, it has to be, you have the people who you found there. Do they see you as African? And if they see you as African, then like I'm saying, it's always a two-way conversation. That if they see you as African, then you see yourself as African as well. And then that's when you can start talking about an African identity. It's not an individual feeling it's not something that you bestow upon yourself it's the people who that bestow oh, it on okay. you okay so if for example uh, my producer slash director johan uh, who by the way is behind the scenes here comes to africa he feels as african as he wants to be and we see him as african does that then make him african? bestow that identity onto him no. i'm just trying to establish no. the, the the parameters no look okay let's look at the north american continent who do we see as people we call them the native americans we're looking at the people who first arrived on that continent and for generations and generations developed an identity connected to that land, named the land, developed cultures connected to that, developed language that's connected to that continent. I'd say African identity is also connected to history. Who were the first inhabitants of this continent? For how long have they developed a way of life that is connected to the roots and to the animals and to the way that they, they till the land and all that kind of stuff? For me, honestly, that's really authentic African identity. Of course, there have been other people who have tapped into the conversation. There's Afro-Arabs, right? Mm -hmm. So there's people who live on the coastline who have, you know, mingled with Arabs, and there's other people who've mingled with, uh, we would even say Chinese, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. You see, I think that it becomes dicey there, and I correct me if I'm wrong, Sophie, but it seems that we are very sensitive about the ownership of this identity. So when other people lay claim to it, we get a little edgy about it. Why are we so sensitive about our identity? I, I think we have... We are we, first of all? I, I absolutely. And I think we, because of colonialism and, and having to deal with imperialism, we are extra touchy about the subject of African identity. Because we had to face a situation where our Africanism was put to the test. And I think that colonialism essentially brought us together as Africans to even lay better claim and more claim to our identity as Africans. Um, and I'm always hearing this thing, you know, Africans rallying behind Africans. Bian, I've heard, it's, I've heard you say it a couple of times, Africans listening to African music. Is there such a thing as a collective African sound, a collective African psyche? There's no collective African psyche because the people of Africa have come from different backgrounds, different, they speak different languages, they, they have come from different tribes, they have different... Mila and the student in Kotuzu. Norms and cultures. Yeah, they have different norms and cultures. Yeah. And so there is no unified African culture. 
just as there is no unified European culture, there's German beer, there's Belgian beer, you know. So in Africa, those things exist, but for the different, you know, communities. Okay, so different and diverse African cultures, but a unified African identity. Okay, so let me break that down. How far-reaching is this identity? Does it apply to our laws? I've heard it said homosexuality is an African. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> to our lawyer, <laughs> tell me about this. That's deep. <laughs> That's deep. That's it, I mean, does it apply to all facets of life or is it just socio-economic? I think it's mostly socio-economic. When it comes to the law, we have um, completely embraced colonial um, sort of dispositions when it comes to how we choose to govern ourselves. So you'd find very little African influence and perhaps the African influence in our law is what people, especially feminists, would term as retrogressive African culture. Uh, but somebody might hear you say that and say, well, you are influenced by the West. You're yes. thinking of Western ideas. We're having this to conversation in English. <laughs> yeah. wow. We're having this conversation in English. English, right? Uh -huh. um, so yeah, I, it, it, so that's the thing, I don't actually believe that in 2019 and in the centuries to come that there would still be this thing called African identity. I feel because of socialization, because of colonization, because of um, globalization essentially, that this idea of Africanism is one that will be depleted mm. in, in the years to come. Um, you don't agree with that? I don't agree, you don't <laughs> agree with that. At yeah. all. I, I, I think it's um, in because of the the influence and the pressure in the context of globalization that's the precise reason why people hold on to their identity mm -hmm. that's the reason why you you cling tight to what makes you different if if there's a force that's that's homogenizing everyone making everyone the same then what makes you unique becomes that much more important so i think in uh, in some ways there will be uh you know like what you're saying like a, a degradation basically of our identity but i think it in paradoxically and, and simultaneously to that, there will be a really strong um, clinging to what makes us different. Um, but it feels that, oh wow, Tattoo is really not man, happy. Burning, man, he's really, he's uh, really not happy I'm with burning. this. Please. You know what, I, I find it funny that none of us have talked about how the fact that African identity has also been tied to our struggle. We have not had a conversation about privilege. We've not had a conversation about this, our skin tone. Let's have it. And the fact that our skin tone, in all its melanated forms, has been the subject of prejudice, has been the subject of slavery, 400 plus years, both in our uh, Arabia and, and, and in the you know, Western Americas or whatever, and that that also contributes to what we consider ourselves to be. Basically, I would imagine that when you, in the face of a lot of adversity, in the face of a lot of hardship, there is this desire to hold on to something. There's this element where if a white person is here even for 30 years, there's still an element of privilege attached to their skin tone that will forever tie them to the European com continent. You see, there's someone, even if it's, you're talking about Indians or if you're talking about Arabs, there'll always be a level of privilege attached to their skin tone that connects them to their... So, or, so what are you saying, Tetra, that we yeah. will always have oppression attached to our identity? No, but that, that oppression and those outside forces, the same way that um, a diamond is formed by outside pressures. Can I get a witness? Somewhere yes! Right yeah. 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 That is, has played a role in shaping what we have. So we are very, very sensitive about holding on to it because so much has been taken from us that we are like, okay, what do we have? All right, we have our skin tone. Okay, we have our sense of rhythm. Okay, we have our, 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 our kitenges. We have our music. We have our nshima, our ugali, our sadza, a pounded yam, you know. So we have all these things that yeah. we are happy to celebrate and we are happy to adorn. But when other people wear them, adorn them in a way as though they're celebrating it, we yeah. call it appropriation or misappropriation. Is, Where is the line? Yeah. The line is drawn when other cultures, culture vulture, African cultures, and then the people of the continent, the people, the originators of that culture are not benefiting from it in any way. Give me an example. So, for example, if Gucci, for example, decides to take the Masai Kitenge and then do a runway, you know, presentation of it and then go oh my god Africa is so amazing but no Africans are actually the Maasai people who are the originators of the of, of that form of fabric are not going to benefit from it that's some bullshit okay so the pro so, the can I ask Vienna a question yeah. like um then how how does that actually work in practice do you want Gucci Mane to shout out Bien in in actually, when he's doing yeah, a song yeah. or you uh, know what I mean I because at the, because in the same breath we have also our music has been influenced by the West we've been influenced by R&B we've been influenced by yeah. sounds that are not from here 
say. Okay, let me come with the microphone, please. Yes, I was just about to say, <laughs> yeah. we have the largest population of educated Africans that, that, that has ever existed. Across the continent, people are woke. And for that reason, it's about time that we took it upon ourselves to prime our culture. But are we doing that, you we know, are. because I've heard it said that Africans will wait until the African-Americans create a black hair movement yeah. for them to adopt their own natural hair. Are we yeah. too late to this party? Do we not have a voice of our own? Can I hear some voices from the back, please? Anyone have an opinion on that? <laughs> um, I feel like we Africans sometimes we wait for maybe someone in the West to do something for it to become a trend then now to validate yes, us. Yes. Now we take it like okay now it's ours now you know it's cool now because now they did it but before we don't take pride in it or something like that of the sort but we just usually wait for maybe someone else to now do it, then we start doing it. Okay, so I suppose the bigger question I'm asking, to what extent are we responsible for shaping this idea of Africanness? But wait, on what she said, mm -hmm. like we actually wait for the Western guys to come up with something and then we adapt. No, most of the time we start something, like one of you know the African identity people will pick up a trend and start doing something. But no one in Africa will actually want to follow what that person is doing. But someone in the Western will actually see and see how they can marginalize or capsulize from that certain idea and then they will actually use it and create a trend then we will all rush and step oh, in and wow. now follow the trend there's some, there's some really tough questions being asked here so I'm going to just return it to these guys are we commodifying Africanness Africanization <laughs> have we commodified it I, I think, so right uh, now more than ever we are commodifying it maybe not to the extent of the West but we're getting to a place where we're starting to learn our strengths so there's business people, there's young girls who are doing amazing things for the hair, hair product industry, and Africans are taking their space. So this African identity narrative is not a trend? I, it's not a trend. Okay. And I think it's, it's, so, it's so sad for us to think that um, we, we are so blank that we look to, for uh, the sources of what makes us us from outside. And, and I think we shouldn't mistake visibility in terms of like media coverage, all that, you know, fame for for being the originators of something. Just because someone famous is making it more famous doesn't mean that it wasn't being done before. So for example, um, if uh, Ugali becomes a trend now in uh, some high-end restaurant in New York, right? That doesn't mean that we were not eating Ugali. It's just that we don't have high-end restaurants in New York. So we shouldn't confuse visibility for nothing happening. Just because you, for trend setting, just because you didn't witnessing being it being done doesn't mean it was not being done or doesn't mean that that famous person who did it was the first to do it okay uh, tattoo is just bouncing on his feet <laughs> itching okay 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 look so you guys heard recently that hakuna matata was trademarked eh? yes. 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 Uh, the kiondo has been Yes. Hakuna Matata just, just from Lion for King. Global yeah. viewers, uh, for your benefit, Hakuna Matata being the Kiswahili phrase from Lion King, which means no worries in Africa. Yeah, which is very revealing and it shows that where we need to step up legally as Africans is we kind of need to be able to get a heavier presence in terms of trademarking, in terms of copywriting, in terms of seeing what we have and the little things that we have as potential uh, exports or whatever. And the only reason I say that is because someone else is going to do it. So everyone. Everyone, so everyone got mad, okay, you know, Lion King, blah, blah, Hakuna Matata, blah, blah. How come, how come we didn't did it, do it first? I have, I'm of the opinion that to a certain degree, colonizers in the spirit of colonization is the idea that everything is up to, to conquer and to take over and all this kind of stuff. And I would say that to a certain degree, the African identity, maybe to a lesser degree, doesn't have as much of that. But that's the nature of the world right now, which means how do we fight that battle? I think by increasing our footprint legally in terms of copyright, in terms of trademark, in terms of... Cause think about even music, man. How many Africans have their stuff getting royalties from, from, from the, you know, just the music, mechanical royalties, streaming royalties, blah, 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 blah. There's a problem. Okay, yeah. so back to you because it's introduced words like legal framework. Yes. Um, do we actually have structures that support uh, these things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. the things that upgrade our identity uh, quote unquote. <laughs> upgrade, upgrade our identity or, you know make it more visible I think so it's just a matter of exploiting what is already there um, because it's, we, we have corporate lawyers we have intellectual property lawyers we have all these frameworks here it's just a matter of how committed are we as Kenyans in different spheres on different professions to actually protect this African identity it's just a matter of actually taking the steps towards it okay I just had a follow-up question on visibility because 
because um, it's one thing to be seen, but also who is representing you on that platform? How important is it that you have African faces or it doesn't matter, you know, if uh, the world gets to know about cornrows from Kim Kardashian, then they know about African hairstyles. How important oh, it, is... It totally matters. Yeah. It yeah. matters. <laughs> it matters very much. So what Tetri says about um, Africans having a, a, a more kind of like legal and copyright uh, presence or strategy is good. But I also think that um, the people who are stealing should stop stealing. Right? So if you have a house which has valuable things in it and someone comes and breaks in and takes your stuff, yeah. right? Um, who, who did the wrong thing? Was it wrong for you to have things in your house or was it the thief who shouldn't have come to steal, right? So I think we should also have that conversation that the reason why Africans don't copyright everything is because it doesn't occur to us it's that these things are, 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 are stealable. I mean, I mean, the people who are stealing are the ones who have a warped mentality. Uh, okay, so uh, um, hold on. Be before we get into the spiral of copyright law, because that's not what we're here for, um, I just want to understand. So we're saying that in our, our mindset, our mindset is more advanced than our actions. We yeah. are more woke in our minds than we are with our actions. So we demand better leadership uh, online, but we're not doing anything to make the spaces better, correct? Yes. So are we... Uh, start with us. No, not really? No. no? We don't demand better leadership, but we're not doing anything. Okay. We are doing things. You know, African youth are working hard. African artists are writing songs about poor leadership. African artists are, are doing uh, are, are doing paintings all over this place about all the, all of those you know bad things that are happening. So I think we are doing stuff. It's just um, it takes time. It takes time. Yeah, these things are going to take time. Do Africans actually know each other? We're talking about a collective identity. But how much I wonder? Do you know about what's happening in Mali or Djibouti? Can you tell me anything about their president? Anything about uh, Malawi? How, how, when, how, when I can, I can barely get a visa to South Africa? South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. You, you look at the Roman Empire, and one of the biggest things they did was make, facilitate easy travel between their different regions, right? Mm -hmm. And here we are, as Kenyans, it's more expensive to fly to, like, Dar es Salaam than I hear to fly to, like, Dubs or something like that. Or yeah. like Dubai. 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 Sorry, is Dubai. Dubai. Yeah, Dubai or whatever. <laughs> we need to understand that these conversations are going to be facilitated by, by things like transport, infrastructure. If I know that I can hop on a high-speed train and be in Central African Republic in six hours, do you know that changes even my perception of them, the conversations that we're having. So I feel like transport is a major, major, major influencer in but the conversation. But is there even an initial curiosity from us? Because, you know, if anybody wants to take a holiday in this country, they'll most likely buy one to Dubai and not necessarily in Mozambique. Mozambique yeah. yeah. Do we have value on our own uh, environments, resources, people? Um, I would say yes and no. It really depends on the context. One of the things that um, is is an is an impediment really in terms of Africans uniting is language. Half of African Africa half of Africa are Francophone speaking, right? They speak a different language from us, and so you almost imagine that half of the continent you can't communicate with, right? And then the rest of the continent, what brings us together? What binds us together? And I don't think that there are enough things that bind us together as Africans. So apart from trade, apart from transportation, and probably. Exactly. I think the only thing is music. So how can we actually be able to bridge those gaps between different countries and bring these cultures together? And I think that's why Saudi Soul and other Africans who are making music for the continent are actually doing a really good job in creating sounds and creating movements that bring Africans together. Okay, but Ben, do you feel that music is already doing this? Are you feeling yeah. a bridge now? Do you know, like, actually the, the, the highest level of trade between African countries is, that one, of, is one of art. Music has, be, has played the biggest role in uniting this continent, in unifying this continent. A lot of people here don't know Nigeria. They know Nigerian music. Nigerian music has been your representation as an African to the whole world for a long, long time. Yeah. And so for that reason, even, uh, I find that music makes other Africans want to go to other countries where the music comes from. Music has really built an awareness of, you know, this movement of young African people who are doing amazing things. And artists and musicians, you know, breaking barriers globally has inspired a lot of African youth. Um, and of course, Bien, as we know, Sauti Sol is always singing in Kiswahili, but I'm curious how many of us here, going back to the point of language, are able to speak in their mother tongue, by show of hands? Mm -hmm. Not me. 
And you're the biggest advocate. <laughs> how, is, how does that work? How, how does that work? Uh, ben, please come here ben, and tell me. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. How many European people speak Latin? Yes. Yes. The thing is, language evolves. And language is a forever evolving you know, thing. I know it's important for us to hold on to our cultures and make sure that we you know, keep it going generation after generation. But at the same time, I'm not going to crucify an African who doesn't speak a vernacular language because yeah, you're born in a, you're, yeah, you're, you're born in a, you want, you want to communicate and you're born in a, in a place where this is what you've been taught. What you can do is make sure that you do your best to be a good Africa. Uh, okay. It's, it's yeah. so interesting because I find that in music particularly, when artists from Africa um, sing or rap in English and not in their vernacular, they get heat for it. If they're considered less African, like mm. why, are you si why are you only singing in English? So I'm really interested to find out, at least from the, from the artists here today, like what, how do you then balance that dichotomy between having to almost reaffirm your African identity mm. each time you sing a song and the need to globalize. Well, Tetoshani, why don't you tell us? Yes. You're, singing, you're singing in English mostly. You're the people who are getting the heat. Right. So I'll start by, I think, was it, how do you say her name? Chimamanda. Mm -hmm. She talked about the myth, the myth of the single st African story. I'll tell you a little bit about mine. I left Kenya when I was six. I lived in Lusaka, Zambia. I lived in Nouakchott, Mauritania. I lived in Dakar, Senegal. Then I went to Vancouver. Then I was in Los Angeles and I came back. My house, my father is Maasai. My mom is Luo. They always spoke to, in English to each other. English became my first language. Now, I lived arguably in all the corners of Africa. Does that make me less African because I can't speak English? My Africanness will always project in a different way. So we have different ways that we project Africanness. There's language, there's, there's style of dress, there's many aspects of culture, how you carry yourself. And your existence. Yeah, just, just, yeah, just the way I look, even just the way I look, you know? Yeah. Just this glow, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's African. So we all have different ways of sort of manifesting the different elements that it takes to really be considered African. Yeah. Language is just one element. But also, you know, another yeah. thing is the, the, the songs on the Billboard charts, the biggest African songs in the world are not in English and not in French. They're in like some Malian dialects, like, yeah, 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 do I? That's the highest, like, grossing song ever. My point is just music is a universal language. Music unites, and it's just music is a vibe. A lot of these things, even like the songs that are really popping, we don't really get what they're saying. Um, but we connect with. We connect. Okay, it seems that this conversation is just kind of going back and forth and touching on things that we've already addressed. Uh, but now I'm coming back to placing value on these uh, cultural markers. I think you talked about it earlier, but why does it seem that it's only now that we're really careful to listen to African music and to wear African fabric? Uh, to be honest, I am... Um, it, it, Probably there's more prominence now, but it's a thing that has been going on for years and, and decades um, on end. I personally reflect on my socialization, my upbringing. Mm -hmm. Like, how did that look like? When I went to school, what was what premium was being placed on the arts? And I feel like we've, the disservice has started, would start essentially when from when we're younger, yeah. right? Because there's a lot of premium praise on sciences, a lot of premium praise on all other things, except the arts and except culture. And I think that now growing up is when now this generation is taking a bit more, um, is being a bit more intentional about honoring and valuing our culture and expressing our cultural identity because there's a point in time where you wouldn't even express your cultural identity and be embraced for it. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we're being very intentional about, um, especially within our generation and I think it will take our generation to change things. Okay, but I just want to ask you guys that question one more time. Why is African identity so important? Yeah, Africa has been the site of, of theft upon theft upon theft. Um, and that sense of loss has been part of our history for centuries, really. Um, and it's in this moment of globalization, cap late stage capitalism, is when it's becoming more intense, right? Um, and so the reason why we are looking to what makes us different is because that's how for us to become human. Mm -hmm. Our human has been identified with not African, right? That, that in the category of human, black does not exist, African does not exist. In order for you to be human, you have to be white or white adjacent, right? And so we are here expanding the category of human to include Africa. That, wow, that People was that was yes. that was that, that hit me right here. Okay, wow. uh, Tetra, you've really been giving us some lines. <laughs> wow. Final thoughts. Wow, wow. I think um, I think African identity is is so important, especially because um, uh, when you consider like really a person's lifetime, 
and you look at when identity is most important, we, we always say it's in the youth, a person's youth, right? And I think especially because we are probably the youngest continent out there, African identity is extremely important. People are branching out, people are trying to dig in roots, people are trying to figure out who am I? And the answer to that question, the African answer to that question is extremely important in terms of how we impact the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Bien, finally. I think uh, for a long time, we've been lost and we've just come from a history of so many, you know, a very dark history of so many gruesome things that have happened. For a better future for this continent, our identity is what we need to find. It's the most important thing. So that it's taught from kids, it's taught to kids from when they're in school to when you grow up and you live it and you embrace it from the beginning. Wow, well, thank you very much, guys. And that's a great place to wrap up this conversation. I suppose we can all agree that it's very complex, and I'm not entirely sure we fully answered that question. But I think one thing we can agree on is that African identity is important because it affirms that we were. And like Christine in the background said, it affirms that we still are. Thank you so much for tuning in. That was so exciting. I'm actually a little exhausted just from all the thinking. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>